When we last left Popolon at the end of Nightmare, he just saved the love of his life, Aphrodite, from the evil Hutness. Rampaging across the lands, slaying demons in a top-down vertically scrolling shoot-'em-up. However, the kidnapping scheme itself was a ruse. While Popolon was on his epic quest to save the day, the evil Gallius attacked Popolon's unattended castle. Not only that, but he also kidnapped Popolon and Aphrodite's unborn baby from the heavens several years before they were supposed to be born. Somehow. So Popolon, together with the recently rescued Aphrodite, set off to the maze of Gallius to put a stop to his wrongdoing and rescue their unborn child. I'm not making the unborn child part up, that's part of the plot as the game tells it itself. The Maze of Gallius is the second game in the Nightmare Trilogy, and as you can tell from the story, having gone far beyond the normal girlfriend-stealing affair that was especially common in 80s video games, it decided to take things in a different direction. Horizontally. Instead of a top-down shooter, Gallius is an action platformer. You control both Popolon and Aphrodite, being able to swap between the two characters whenever you want. It isn't quite hot swapping, you can't just press a button and instantly switch. Instead, you have to open a menu as if you're selecting equipment. But you can still enter that menu while jumping or even when you're drowning. So at the very least, this game is more technologically advanced than Donkey Kong 64. Okay. Popolon can break through boulders and has more control over his jumps, while Aphrodite has a static jump height but doesn't immediately drown as soon as she touches water. Both have their own independent health bar and their own items to help bridge the gap in their weaknesses. But with these two characters, you have to brave the castle the game takes place in. Traveling through the castle, you find items that help power you up, so more of the dungeon becomes easier to explore. The items aren't in special treasure rooms or chests, they're kind of just hanging around in the castle. A good number of them show up by breaking up rocks. Some of them can be bought from stores if you have enough money. If you're not familiar with the game, you'd almost not recognize that these items are different from the consumable items that enemies drop, since those also appear from inside of rocks and in stores. For the most part, areas aren't typically locked off in the main castle area most of the game takes place indirectly. Items you find can help you walk through a lot of the obstacles without taking damage or deal with certain enemy types. The journey isn't divided into multiple castles or stages in a typical sense either. As soon as the game starts, you can explore the castle freely and try to collect as much of the power-ups as you want in any order. Chances are you will get murdered in most directions you go, as Gallius can be quite brutal at times. But the full journey is not the longest one, so a little bit of trial and error as you come to grips with it isn't too bad. Though, I did use a cheat for this review. I normally don't cheat in games I cover, at most I've used an EXP exploit in Etrian Odyssey 3, just to get the footage of it and, well, experiencing it for myself. One of the fascinating things about Maze of Gallius is that the game has permadeath. Kind of. If either Popolon or Aphrodite die, that's it. They're dead forever. Sort of. There is a revival mechanic in the game. There's a door in the castle that for some reason you can't enter. As soon as one of your characters dies and you found the salt item in the castle, you can finally enter it. Inside, death will let you bring back your lover, but at an extremely steep cost. Apparently you can put a price on love. Also, you can only make this trade once unless you restart the game and continue the traditional way. The traditional way of continuing being passwords. The passwords in the game are fairly long, but at the very least, this is an MSX game, so the game is played using a keyboard, meaning you can just type out the passwords. Even then, it's still not great when you enter the entire string and the game rejects it because you entered an O where you should have put a zero. I don't even think the game's passwords uses O's, but they still let you enter them for some reason, so I'm not sure. But at the very least, with modern technology, we can just take a screenshot of the password screen, playing it on an emulator. Or use your phone to take a photo of it if you're playing on original hardware. If you played this back in the day, you'd absolutely have to write these things down in their entirety. Either way, you want to be careful neither Popolon or Aphrodite die. Which is easier said than done, because there are plenty of moments where the game is out to get you, like falling into lava is a surefire way of losing a character. The character you have left is at least moved to safety, so you can continue your travel after your loved one has died. But again, you'd really rather not lose anyone in this game because of the sheer amount of resource farming you need to do to get them back, so I cheated. Once again, the famous Konami code for extra lives makes a return in this game.
You know the Konami code, right? When you're on the first screen of the game after having started it and you type out Zeus on your keyboard? Yeah, that's the one. All our games used to feature this code. This isn't a 30 continues or lives cheat though. The Zeus password makes it so that when you go game over, you can press F5 to continue. You have to press it in time though. You can't wait to use this death as a natural pause moment to catch your breath. That's a good way to lose progress, not that I'm speaking from experience, obviously. The cheat takes some of the sting out of plunging headfirst into lava or being knocked into it by a bat, or the complete lack of health recovery items in this game. That's one of the stranger things in the maze of Gallius, and I sort of understand the logic behind it. There's a small number of rooms in the game where upon entering it, you see bubbles floating around. These are fairy rooms. In order to actually get healed by the fairy hidden in the room, you have to stand still in exactly the right space to spawn it. There's no in-game indication of where this is, so you just have to know what room this is and how to use it. Which is kind of how this game works a lot of the time. You're also intended to figure out where the items are and figure out which ones you need before advancing into the dungeons scattered through the castle. Otherwise, you'll likely end up in rooms with no way to progress and no earthly idea of what you need to do to advance. This is not helped by secret passages frequently opening by killing all enemies, a typical Zelda 1 style puzzle, you might think. Except Zelda games typically play a sound letting you know there's a secret in this room and whatever you need to do tends to be in that very same room too. In Maze of Gallius, you often have to beat all the enemies in completely different rooms from where the unlockable thing happens. Some of the game's items are also kind of just fascinating on their own. One of the earliest ones you get your hands on is a warp ring. Upon using it, the game teleports you back to the password room close to the screen that you started at. This is a very central area that makes it very easy to get around to other areas, so it's a very useful item to have. And in a way, it feels extremely modern. It's a non-consumable free use item to return to base. In a lot of ways, it's your main lifeline to get through the game. Especially nice to have in a game where you can explore around freely the way that you can here. Having the ability to go from one corner of the map back to the center is very nice. Another item that is very nice to have is the one that lets you break all the rocks on the screen by pressing the attack button once. There's something satisfying about this, especially if you've spent time stuck with only Aphrodite slowly chipping away at rocks. Maze of Gallius is very exploration heavy, and it's a style of gameplay that was becoming quite popular at the time, both on the NES and on the MSX. These are both platforms that couldn't handle fast action with cutting edge graphics the way that you'd get at arcades at the time. So if you were making something original, it'd make sense to slow things down making it more of an adventure instead of high-octane action. This is why quite a lot of what developers learned on the MSX would often carry over to NES projects, though you could also argue that the inspirations could go the other way as well. It's hard to describe, but a lot of the movement and presentation in The Maze of Gallius feels like it's taking the original Zelda and turning that into a side-scrolling platformer. No, not like that. And that's closer, but it's not quite it either. Something about the enemy types and how they move, especially the bats, feels like the first Zelda. Structurally, the game is also quite close to the first Zelda. The closest I can get to describing it is if you take the treasure rooms from the first Zelda game and add a jump button. That is Maze of Gallius. Structurally, the game is also quite close to the first Zelda. One of the items closest to the first room is a dungeon key. Once you collect it, the max HP of your character you picked it up as increases. You can also use it to enter the first world in the castle. Worlds are basically dungeons. They're what you need to clear to beat the game and have to be done in sequential order since each world's boss drops the key that opens the door to the next one in the castle area. It's an interesting mix between a heart container or Triforce piece and a big key. Except big keys didn't become a thing in Zelda until A Link to the Past a few years later. Dungeons also have their own item pool that you'll find inside them. Collecting these makes the boss at the end easier to face. Lowering their damage, letting you deal more damage to them, and taking away the ammo requirement for your sub-weapons when facing them. There's also a dungeon map that lets you navigate the areas more easily. These items come back every single world, so you'll always want to keep an eye out for them when you're entering a dungeon. 
Obviously, these are replacing the map items of the first Zelda. Though, once again, there is something analogous to the big key that you want to keep an eye out for hidden in these areas. One of the items that you really want to buy before going into the first dungeon can be found in a store somewhere to the south of the starting screen, the magnifying glass. This item counts as a sub-weapon, and using it lets you read what's written on tombstones in the dungeons. Most of them are empty, but one tombstone will have a magic spell written on it. You'll want to remember that when you get to the boss room. Once you get to the end of the dungeon and find the room with a big seal in the background and ominous music playing, you need to type out that magic spell to summon the boss. It is interesting to be given text hints you need to remember and maybe should write down if your memory isn't that great in completely different rooms, needing to connect this information across a decent distance. No game would ever copy this format directly. The dungeon bosses tend to be weak to one sub-weapon type or another. They're not too sophisticated or complex, but they do have some nice sprite work going on, especially for its time and platform. I don't have too much to say about them, they're fairly simple 8-bit era boss fights, but they do have some nice variety between them. Something that did stand out to me with the boss fights, though, is that instead of a health bar or a color change over time, the game has a kind of unique way of conveying their health to the player. The more damage is dealt to the boss, the faster the boss theme plays, which in turn also increases the feeling of pressure in a very natural way. It makes the fights that little more tense. I like it. Also, you really, really do not want your characters to die during these fights, even with the continue cheat active. The characters being swapped after dying resets the boss's health, making you redo the entire fight from the start. But at least you can safely swap between the two characters from the menu without the health resetting. After beating a boss, you get another key. Decide who to give that health to, and then teleport out before seeking another dungeon, or choosing to farm for upgrade items or consumables. It's a simple but satisfying gameplay loop. Once you have more max health, it becomes easier to survive the enemies the game throws at you. It sounds obvious enough by itself, but there's an extra reason for that. Maze of Gallius has an EXP system. Both Popolon and Aphrodite gain experience points from killing enemies separately from each other, there's no level up system or anything like that in place though. Instead, once your experience meter is full, your character goes back to full HP, making it easier to survive in an interesting way. I didn't like this system much at first, but it did grow on me after a little while. At least you can't outgrind the difficulty curve and overpower the enemies by just roaming around for long enough in an exploration focused game. The normal keys in the game also kind of work by their own rules, unlike most games. They're not static items dropping in certain locations or from treasure chests like you'd expect if you play most video games out there. They're random item drops from enemies, like arrows or money. Once you open a locked door with a key and go through it, the door immediately locks again. So keys are something you want to have a healthy stock of before entering a dungeon, since those love having a bunch of locked doors inside them. You often have to travel back and forth through them. A lot of the time, you don't even need to go through these doors. You can find ways around them, so you're kind of trading keys for convenience or general blindness. And just like with Nightmare, there's an advanced MSX2 version made years later by fans. In fact, this one came out last year. It's interesting. I quite like the visuals for it, and there's some nice quality of life updates applied to the game. The biggest one being that you can hover over items in your inventory to see what they actually do without having to refer to the manual to figure out what they're for. I did have my game corrupt at some point playing this version, and when it did it was giving me faulty passwords that I couldn't load my game from, effectively killing my run. I'm not sure how this happened, if it was the emulator I was using or what. I haven't seen people complain about this, so if you really need your Mario All-Stars updated version of Maze of Gallius because the original visuals are too crude for you to go back to for some reason, this is a thing that exists. Now I mentioned in the previous video that Maze of Gallius is the entry that to most people will be especially interesting, and that it has an especially strong legacy and impact on games ever since. One of the more direct and immediate games inspired by it is obviously Castlevania II. The more explorative style of gameplay, experience system, and focus on strange secrets and ideas that make you wonder how the hell you were supposed to figure all of this out. It all checks out. It's all here. Even the ceiling slimes. Most of the classic style of Castlevania games after this, Castlevania 3, Rondo of Blood, Bloodlines, 
they'd all end up having more than one playable character. And well, without Castlevania 2's focus on exploration and RPG mechanics, we probably would not have gotten Symphony of the Night. In an interview translated on Schmopplations, Maze of Gallius even gets put down as the main point of influence for Castlevania 2 by Akamatsu, the main creative force behind the Castlevania series. This was in response to being asked about Metroid being a potential influence, and that being denied. And I don't think it's a stretch to say that Igarashi took cues from the Maze of Gallius once he took over either. Even beyond just the free-roaming castle structure of Symphony of the Night replacing the linear structure of previous games, the seal-drawing mechanic from Dawn of Souls seems like a direct connection to the seal-breaking magic keyword typing of Gallia's, using the platform's main style of input to mess with the boss's seal. And if that one feels like a stretch, then how about having a central hub castle with explorable subworlds that you go through while switching between a male and female protagonist? Because that does not only describe the maze of Gallius, that exactly describes Portrait of Ruin. In fact, I don't think Gallius is the only thing Konami could have been pulling from with their old output either. Konami had a thing for exploration-focused platforming in those days. The maze of Gallius is just one of the games under that umbrella. The Goonies 2, the first NES Ninja Turtles game, the third Game Boy Ninja Turtles game, those are all games that could potentially be seen as Metroidvanias these days. Which is why it can be frustrating, people tend to think Symphony of the Night was when Konami suddenly decided to copy Metroid's formula. If anything, it was the moment that Konami perfected something they'd been at for three consecutive console generations. Most of that output being well before Super Metroid even released. As much as we'd like to interpret Japanese canon through the lens of American releases and popularity, Metroid was never all that popular over in Japan, and they'd later make other M to try and rectify that. It isn't surprising Metroid was such a hit in the West, though. You have this cool space guy in an oversized armor, firing his gun at everything that moves. We love that genre in the West. Wait, that's a woman? What's a woman? This isn't a big ramble about how we need better descriptive genre names or anything. Everyone knows what you mean when you say Metroidvania. It does what a genre designation should do. Find more of what you like in an easy enough way. Which isn't something we've always had, even with some of the more direct genre names. People often used to use fighting games and beat-em-ups interchangeably, since you beat em up and fight people in both. But I do feel like the term Metroidvania has sort of damaged the perception of what games were actually important to development of titles like this. It's a term that came to be because that's the two main sources of inspiration that indie developers would take after years later, not a sequence of the only two noteworthy events in video game canon. It's nice we have genre-defining words that let us group games together, but maybe we shouldn't stress the literal definition so much as we should pay attention to the contents of what's associated with them, since genres tend to be much more loose and much broader concepts than we like to think. Anyway, that's how I feel. <laughs> And I'd argue that the two real key players that shape the direction of games in this style are the Maze of Gallius and The Legend of Zelda. More so than Metroid or Castlevania ever did. In its own way, The Maze of Gallius also directly inspired games very much like it later down the line. Like you could argue that La Mulana is a Gallius-like, and I don't think the creator behind it would argue against this, instead welcoming the comparison. Especially now that Takumi Naramura is directly working on a remake for Gallius officially supported by Konami. So, do I recommend The Maze of Gallius? Yes, wholeheartedly. This game is a masterpiece, especially considering the time that it was originally released. It still holds up to this day, too. If we really have to compare this to Metroid, then I will say one thing. I would much rather play The Maze of Gallius 10 times back to back than play the first Metroid game again just once. It is a very well-designed and fun title and I look forward to the official remake whenever it comes out. Speaking of Metroid, I ask an important question to the people on Patreon and Discord. Metroid or Vania? I made it intentionally vague. Is this referring to the Castlevania style of game? Is it referring to two IPs? Maybe both. This one got close though, with very different responses on Discord and Patreon. Discord favored Metroid. Patreon favored Vania. Personally, I gotta go with Vania. I universally prefer both Classic and Iga over any Metroid. I do really like Super Metroid and Metroid Prime, but I don't like them as much as I do Rondo of Blood, Symphony of the Night, or Aria of Sorrow. Next time, we crawl a dungeon in the dark. 
As always, this video was made with the support of people supporting the channel on Patreon and YouTube members. If you would like to become one of the names that you see scrolling on the screen right now or vote in future polls, head over to patreon.com slash above up or join the channel as a member and I will uh, see ya.